20 odd, I'm out of focus. Okay. <laughs> That is my theme music. I'm oh. um, that's it. This should be Um, peace, everybody. Everybody can hear me. Thumbs up. You never know. Dominique, you got, can hear me? I can hear you. We're great. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm so excited. As you can see, I'm excited about this. Yes. <laughs> this movie coming out February 12th. 2021, we um, so many people were part of it, a, a three-year process, an incredible process. And that's what I want to talk to with who I am to uh, with here right now is Dominique Fishback. She's an actually born Brooklyn Knight, like my husband. So <laughs> I peeped it. I was like born and raised in Brooklyn. All gotta right. Say it, gotta say it. <laughs> Uh, you're an actress, of course, a, a poet, mm -hmm. a writer on the rise. You also, I was reading, did a one woman play. Yes. Yeah. Perverted. And mm -hmm. You just did Project Power on Netflix, which I watch. I loved anything like um, high tech, fixed sci fi. <laughs> yeah. Fiction. But I first saw you, I was watching this show called The Deuce on HBO mm -hmm. about sex workers in the 70s. And growing up in the Bronx <laughs> and going into the city, 42nd Street, the way it looks now, it's like two completely different worlds. But, but I saw you in that and then you were there for a couple seasons and then not, so I didn't like what happened to you. Yeah. But <laughs> I really thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bloody that this is really from the perspective of women who work and as sex workers. It wasn't well, you were working for people, but you weren't in your in your character. So I, I felt like that was a very hard um, role for you to play. Was that one of your first roles? Yeah, I had done uh, Show Me a Hero on HBO, which was about the housing uh, uh, story in Yonkers in the 80s. And that was yeah. the first David Simon project that I did. And after doing um, Show Me a Hero, one day he came to me uh, ADR and he was like, I don't know if you heard about my new show. I was like, no, he says, but I have a role with you in mind, but it's not a role you take just to take it. Um, uh, so read the scripts and if you don't want to do it, it's no harm, no foul because it's about the rise of the porn industry in the 1970s. And I was like, okay. So I read the script and no, it, I, I felt safe to, to do this project with them because I had done my first thing. Um, and because he already said like, if, if you don't want to do it, it's no harm, no foul. So I knew that it was a, a safe space because obviously I want to continue to work with David Simon. Um, but I really had to think about it. I, I asked my mom, like, how do you feel about nudity and all this kind of type of stuff? And she was like, well, you're, you're an actress, Dom. If you, you know, if you if you believe in it, then then I'm, I'm OK with it. And that was really what I what I cared about. I wrote like an open letter to my family. Listen, I don't want you to say you don't have to do this or that. I know I don't have to do whatever if I'm doing this because I want to do it. So you don't have to say you don't, you know what I'm saying? Just all of these things that people like to put on us. And that was my main concern. It wasn't even, it wasn't even what I was doing so much so as how it was affecting the people that I love, you know, um, which that was something that I had to deal with myself. I started meditating a lot to make sure that the things that I'm doing is, is authentic to me and so, you know, and not for the response of how my family or friends would feel about that. Um, and no, and so like, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, like going natural, cause I hadn't, I wasn't natural with my hair at the time. Going natural with my hair was actually my nudity, right? So once, once I went natural with my hair, I was like, oh, I don't have a problem with my body or anything like that. And so, and then Darlene, you know, she was reading books, you know, she had a whole different dynamic, you know, she was watching movies with the genre. Yeah. With. And so I really got to bring a different kind of heart uh, to the show. So that was a lot of fun. 
That's, I mean, that's great. I would have, I think you're the first person artist I've ever heard say, I wrote my family a letter, you know, which yeah. means they're, they're part of who you are, obviously supportive, but also like, you know, I'm doing this for these reasons. It's not exploitative. It's part of my craft and all that, you know, so, okay. Leon Del wrote, Yeah. Okay. Just so you know, nobody's trying to hit on you, Dominique. That's my husband who now just told everybody publicly that he loves me and I love you too, babe. Uh -huh. And Dominique was born and raised in Brooklyn, which I have to ask, what part of Brooklyn? East New York, baby. East New York. East New York. <laughs> I went to high school in Brownsville. You know, yeah. I best guy. So it's all it's all over. But I'm born and raised in East New York. Um, lived there pretty much my whole life before I moved downtown. I lived downtown. Where's your family from? From here? Uh -huh. Yeah, my family's from here. My my grandfather was from St. Vincent, you know, but my grandmother was born in Brooklyn. My mom, my dad, you know, there's a long line of Brooklynites. Yeah. yeah. Well, the first time I met you was um, we were at a meeting at Fred Hampton's house, uh, yeah. the son of Fred Hampton, senior chairman Fred Hampton and his mother, um, mother comrade Akua and Jerry, you know, and I said to you, I said, Oh, I, I seen you in that show. You were good, you know, and we didn't uh, we didn't get to talk right away. But that was a long, long meeting with you yeah. and Daniel, who plays Fred Hampton, you know, senior. I, I wonder what you thought when you were when you walked in there. We sat down. The intros are made. What are you thinking of? Because you got in this role. You've read the script. Yeah. You're from Brooklyn. Yeah. You have pops of politics. You, I'm assuming you knew who Fred Hampton was. I could be wrong, but yeah. Um, yeah, just when you're first sitting there, and we all start like talking and listening. Uh, you, I don't remember, but I was like, uh, I'm nervous. Like, I really was like, let me clear the air right now because I know my voice gonna be shaking. I was like, you know, and one of the things that I said to Mama Okua was like, I want to apologize, you know, because everything moves so fast, and they had to kind of we had to decide who was gonna be a part of the movie before we could get to them. And I know she's alive and here with us and I didn't wanna disrespect her by agreeing to play her if she doesn't approve or know who I am. So that was really important for me to like get out, you know, the way that the, if, if I didn't believe that in my heart that I, that I enough care to understand, you know, or to try to understand or to be open to what they were saying, then I wouldn't have, even agreed to do it, but I felt that I instinctively that that I that I could that I could do it. Like I and I would give my all. I would give everything I had to it. You know, and so that's kind of why I agreed. And then hopefully like I was like fingers crossed we meet them and they they're excited about doing this project. That was really important to me. Um and so I knew that us going to Chicago to meet them was a was a big deal. We had to go around the table. Chairman Fred said uh, Sharon Fred Jean said, I want to know why every single one of y'all want to be a part of this movie. And I was like, oh my God. And then Daniel was sitting next to me. And he went first. And Daniel's like, he's he's so he's so beautiful the way he speaks and so honest and authentic that you know he galvanized me. And I was sitting there and I was like, okay, I want to rise to the occasion because he's ready to bring it. You know, how do I support him? You know, um, the way that he galvanized me and the way that he spoke, I wondered, you know, is that how Chairman Fred galvanized people? Like I was opening myself up to like him being the chairman that I would be the deb towards, you know, and what what would that that look like? And then then Chairman Fred Jr. was like, uh, "Are we gonna we gonna come back to you?" And he said the thing, and I was like, "Oh my God, I was so scared." <laughs> you were you, you yeah. were definitely. I mean, sitting there, I was like, "You, everyone who hadn't been there yet or known Fred, yeah, you you get that because there's also been." Um, a lot of people who've tried to make this movie. I understand. Uh, they, yeah. And even though the script had already been done, you know, Chairman Fred was was with it. Now, but now he's meeting and she's meeting like the people that are gonna play them, his his, his mother, his comrade, you know. And I was like, that's a lot because. For those that don't fully know the Fred Hampton story, that you should know it. This is a biopic, not everything. It's not a documentary, although there's great a uh, couple documentaries out there. But you know, I always think of Akua like you were in that apartment and you lived, and like 25 days later had your son. Yeah. yeah. You know, and she wasn't supposed to live. 
Yeah. It is clear because not only, I mean, the movie, it, it, it is heartbreaking because we all know how it ends. But I don't think people think about that enough in that trauma. You know, so you as an actress, now you're meeting the person, you're connected, you know the story, you're you're um leaning on your 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 um partner Daniel and then on the Keith and then the whole crew, the production, all of that. Were there times where you thought like, yo, this is heavy? What I'm gonna have to play. Um uh you know, I didn't you know, I didn't realize how heavy it was until towards the end of filming when we had to do the assassination scene because it ended up falling on the 50th anniversary of the of the assassination of Chairman Fred. Um, and by the end, we were coming towards the end of filming and we had all come to love and uh, care about each other and hold space in a way. I learned to trust black men in a way that I never learned. I learned how to be, I learned the type of woman that I wanted to be. I understood womanhood and differently. I understood unconditional love differently. My whole being was expanding by playing Mama Cool, by playing Deborah Johnson. That, uh, you know, the first thing that I, I made, that I prayed about when I got it was like, how do I portray that love? How do I get to the point where by the end, you could believe that the sacrificial gesture she does, how do I get there in love? You know, um, so I journaled a lot as my character. The journal that she carries around in the movie is one that I suggested that she had. And I would, and I drew every picture. I wrote every word. I would write a poem for every single monumental moment that she had with, with, with Fred. Like, you know, when she first sees him in the school, I wrote a poem about that. When they first kiss, I wrote a poem about that. You know, I wrote a poem about every single thing. And I, and I was journaling and trying to imagine the out the world that we don't get to see. And I think by doing that and leaving myself open and my spirit like open to tell this story, I allowed that by the end, the day before we had to shoot, uh, film the assassination scene, I, I my stomach was in knots. I was in a hotel and my heart just was like pounding so hard and I'm trying to understand what was going on. Then I just tell, kept telling myself, no, Dane's gonna be okay. Dane's gonna be okay. Like I had to, I was trying to understand what was happening in my body. And then finally I realized, I said, oh, my body, it can't separate between what is mm -hmm. real and what I've allowed myself to believe so truly and so deeply, you know? Um, and I, you know, I said, you, you know, you prayed for this love and now you have to mourn this love because this love was lost because of what the FBI and the Chicago police did. And, and, you know, and even though Daniel and I and the cast and I will love each other for forever, like the love that we got to inhabit during that time is not a love that belonged to us, you know? So I was only experiencing it for a little while, but it was so profound and so life-changing that I had to like cry the night before and then do the scene. Yeah, I mean, so you 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 archive basically the movie for the movie, but you and, and also talking about love that's a, that's a, a lot of what I think of when we think about our elders who are in this movie and, and their partners, um, you know, and especially when one is assassinated in, in, in that way, as well as um, Mark Clark was also assassinated. And I'll, I'll tell people, I'm like, I want to know if there's a love story. Like, I don't, I don't want people, especially younger people, to look at people who engage in revolutionary politics um, and are hardcore radical or, I mean, just as progressive left. That's not even the proper word. But, you know, being part of the Black Panther Party for self-defense, all those people knew that it can end like that. But that's there was still relationships. Yeah, that was great. There, you know, and uh Chairman Fred is is the best part of that relationship that he got to live because his mother got to live. So hearing you put it that way and the vulnerability that you must have to have. Um, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't think about those things. I've never been on a set of a movie until this one. And I, I was there with the church scene. Mm. And yeah, when when Daniel came out the first time, I looked at Charles. Charles Keen is one of the producers. Y'all y'all should check out everything Charles Keen is doing, which is flipping Hollywood upside down um, mm -hmm. with his company, Stay Macro, and really supporting like black narratives and storytellers. We looked at each other and I we started crying. 
Because I was like, he sounds just like him. So, this is crazy. Time, I mean, whew, he transcended. He was gone. I was watching. I was. He was. He was not there. Daniel was not there. And so many times, I was like, right. This is why it's a movie, and they have to do nine different shots. And there's one point where I think we're still doing no that scene is still happening in the middle of the afternoon after break and i just see daniel kind of lay down and then he got up and i was like every time it was so it, i got chills I, I i was like this is why fred hampton could create the rainbow coalition and why young people and older people people were gravitating towards him which made him so dangerous yeah. but i tell everybody yo you gotta watch daniel do this scene if that don't get an award or something i don't know what does because how do you do it that many times and then how you're talking about you the last scene is, is you know the assassination scene no matter what you're doing that scene a lot too yeah what a trauma, you know. So, and Fred was on the set, I know, and I think um, Comrade Akua was there a couple of times. She, was, she came to set for sure. I know she was there for that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so are you? How excited are you? <laughs> well, so much buzz, but all of you were amazing, incredible. You. This is your breakout role for sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm most excited. Yesterday, I got to do some interviews with Mama Kua. And she said, like, seeing, she said, seeing Daniel and I up there, it made her remember and it made her miss that love. So to mm -hmm. me, that was, that was really profound because that was, you know, I'm a romantic myself, right? Like, so I remember even talking to Shaka in the beginning after I read the script, you know, I said, I have two thoughts, but I don't want to overstep. So let, let me know if you want to hear them. He said, you'll be playing her. You can't overstep. Give me your notes. And one of them was, you know, a lot of times when it comes to romances and, and black women, black artists, you know, we always have to prove ourselves in love, right? Like we have to stand by somebody when they, when they go to jail or we get pregnant and only then are we worthy of their commitment. And I wanted to make sure that that was not the case in this story that we got to see that he loved her for her mind, you know, and what she offered. Um, and so for the, we call it the Malcolm scene, you know, when they're talking about Malcolm X, that was really important for that moment that her mind that you see that his wheels are spinning off of something that she is is bringing to the table mentally um but you know i i was like listen in when it comes to love i just want to make sure that we know that she is worthy of love before all the other stuff before right. being before even being a, a comrade like just innately deserving black women are deserving you know what I mean, and um, and so so yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm I'm I was happy that Mama Kua like felt that or felt the connection between Daniel and I it was really important. Um, and I'm just su I'm super excited that that people are responding the way that they are, and that the the next generation gets to know that we have heroes. You know, we didn't really get to learn that in school. I didn't learn about the Black Panther Party when I was in school. You know, yeah. times you know there's a white savior. You know what I mean? And that's what we, we we're conditioned to believe. But no, he was 21 years old. And a lot of them were 19, 20 years old. And they cared so much about the people, about about us, about people that weren't even here yet. They were for, so forward thinking that they were willing to give their lives for us so that we could know self-determination. You know what I mean? Like, what mm -hmm. a gift. Yeah, what a gift. So many did, yeah. I. In my research, and I, I study the 70s and social movements and things like that. I and I again grew up in the Bronx and then Westchester County. I had to go to college <laughs> in upstate New York to be like, I don't know who the young lords are, and everybody's mm -hmm. like, You're Puerto Rican, right? I'm like, uh, I don't know. I hadn't the, the closest thing I could remember, and I went to school way earlier than you in the 80s, was um. Malcolm X that Spike Lee wrote and do the right thing because those came out and um, one of the overarching things for me growing up and people my age uh, growing up in the city is that we also dealt with um, Donald Trump trying to get the Central Park Five assassinated the brothers you know who were convicted of that rape so and and then um, the Howard Beach incident they were peripheral for me because mm -hmm. my dad would bring home the paper and be like yo you see this like they didn't do this or 
this dude's a racist. He's trying to get him executed. So my dad would bring papers. I definitely knew what it was to be Puerto Rican. That was like a hundred you know, all the time. But like I said, I didn't know about the young lords and I didn't know until I went to get my master's at Cornell University that I was like, wait a minute, Fred Hampton started the Rainbow Coalition, not Jesse Jackson, which I should have known, but I didn't, you know? And then in 2001, I got to meet Fred, who to me was almost not human because mm -hmm. everybody knew who he was. And I was just like, oh man, wow, this is, this is crazy. And, and, and I think for all of those, the, the children, sometimes they don't get to be anything but the son or the daughter. Mm -hmm. But I know that Fred takes that legacy 100% seriously. So does this give you now that this summer too was, you know, these uprisings, continuing uprisings around police violence, state violence, and all of that. How were you able to process this summer? Because you have finished the movie. Mm -hmm. and, and this stuff is right in our faces again. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was really hard because I was trying to figure out my place. I know that as a writer, I know my, my place in terms of, of Black storytelling as an artist, as an actor. But when it came to like marching and all that kind of stuff, I was really like, is that where I'm supposed to be? You know what I mean? And I marched, I did, but it never felt like that was me doing my calling. Right. But mm -hmm. then I was like, well, I have this one woman show subverted about the destruction of black identity. I've been trying to get it produced for so long. I've been working on these things. I did the hate you give. I'm constantly doing art that represents this. But like, is that enough? You know, and at this point, it keeps happening. Am I going to keep writing about it? Like I was really hard on myself over the summer and I actually got to speak to Daniel. I was having a hard time and uh, I spoke to him and he kind of said, I'm paraphrasing. Um, but he said, you know, if we're all one. Um, and we all work as one body. We don't expect the like the hands to do what the feet does, or like something of that. The the head to do what the you know the torso does, or something like that. And he's like, so he wanted me to remember that that art is important. That you know, documenting history is important. It, documenting as we live through it. And so it really, I was like, okay, I, I saw that. You know what I mean? Like he kind of helped me to be re inspired about writing and and being an artist during this time. Cause it kind of felt like, is that, is that revolutionary? Is that enough? Like, am I, am I helping anything or am I just pretending? You know what I mean? Like I was really hard on myself during that time. Yeah, no, art is, art is critical to me. Art is political and politics is art. You know, I, I'm not an artist like so many uh, uh, of friends and comrades and all of that, you know, but I definitely, that, that's some, that, that feeling this summer, um, for those of us who were like, I can't join for a reason um, because of COVID or is this, what am I supposed to be doing now more to help younger people? Am I supposed to be supporting the organizations on the ground? So, you know, as an artist, you're going through that. But I, 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 I read that you also, the poem that you recite in the movie is your poem that yeah. you wrote. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, Did yes. you write it while the movie was happening? Or that was that one of the notes you gave Shaka? Yeah, that was one of the notes I, I gave Shaka. That was like the first note I said, you know, one of the things she says is first says to, to Chairman Fred in the movie is do you like poetry? And uh, the Panthers are and were very poetic people, yet we don't hear a poem. I think we miss an opportunity. He was like, you know, I think you're right. Do you want to take a shot at that poem? And I was like, oh, like I wasn't expecting for him to like offer that to me. Um, and I was actually filming Project Power with Jamie Foxx and Justin Gordon Live on Netflix. Um, and I was in a hair and makeup trailer and I got an email saying, hey, did you work, work on that poem? And I was like, sheesh. So I started like writing and, and said, okay, Chairman Fred had these dimples. Like, how do I, how do I mix a mother or a lover's viewpoint into, into wartime? You know, there's the, the duality of like wanting to see what this baby is going to have that is like yours. But then the fact that I could lose both of you because of what we're doing, because we're in this, this, this war zone. Um, and so, no, yeah, I was, I was happy that I got to not only bring my, my likeness and my, my image as an artist to this story, but also to have a personal stamp to say, like, I wrote something, you know, I, I feel like we've been preparing our whole lives for certain things. And these were definitely one of the moments that I was preparing my whole life for without even knowing, you know. 
Yeah, so the movie comes out and you're busy, busy, busy. You said you have subverted. Are you gonna um you already did it a couple of times, right? But you are you gonna try to bring it back when theater comes back or and that was always the plan. I always wanted to do it on um on Broadway, but now we're in, in talk so with a very special um collaborator that I worked with before, um, in works of like trying to make it some kind of special. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're we're talk we're talking about that now. Um, definitely continuing to write and stuff like that. But subverted is definitely high up on the, you know. But then also because subverted, subverted is kind of like timeless in the sense that black li like black like police terrorism and Black Lives Matter is kind of a a thing that's been happening. So I wrote this in two thousand and twelve, two thousand thirteen. You know what I mean? And so um, I don't want to update it for it to feel like it happened in 2020 because I think the power of it is that it, it happened before that is constantly happening. So really trying to navigate what it what will it look like for a 2021 audience in this way when dealing with the past, which is not period because it's still 2000s. That kind of doesn't feel like a period piece. So I'm trying to figure trying to figure that out. I mean it must be an incredibly uh, a time of creativity, but also I, I know, at least with me, the, the isolation after a while is like, okay, you know, ho hopefully the, the crazy man is gone and there's some actual scientists <sighs> right then, you know, you're, you're in New York City, I'm in, in New York, upstate New York, and um, many, many political differences with the governor here, but compared to so many other states, it could have, it, it can be mad worse. So I hope everybody's out there being safe. Um, yeah, so I know you have a hard out because you got a whole round of interviews. First and foremost, everybody, I didn't introduce my name at the beginning, although everybody watching should know I'm Rosa Clemente. This is my show, Disrupt the Chaos. I'm going to be bringing it back slowly. Um, my first show back after three months is with the amazing, brilliant, one of the stars of Judas and the Black Messiah, Dominique Fishback. You check out all her work. Watch, watch. I love Project Power. I love doing deuces. I'm gonna watch everything you're about. You. Um, and next time I see you, hopefully we would be able to hug. But you enjoy every accolade out there, sis, because you you put it, you put that role down. And if Mama Kua said you did, then you did. Thank you. I appreciate. You know? Thank you for taking the time. I love it. You know, I love it. Yeah. I want to say also, like having you there in the house, like you like the warm energy that you provided, it was like you were a perfect liaison to like kind of usher us through everything because we knew we like knew that you were knowledgeable, knew what you would talk about, knew the family well. And then the way, like, of course, they're gonna be more guarded, but the way that you said, you know, it's okay, it's okay, like, like really allowed me to be like, okay, like. We're not like it's not there it's not personal what's happening. It's just the the politics of it all. And mm -hmm. kind of really having you to like get that through was really, really helpful. I don't know if you if you know, but I was so happy mm -hmm. to have you. So happy to know you. Um, I was just happy to be part of it. But thank you for, for sharing that. I, I I think I'm that type of person that sometimes I'm like, all right, let's just figure it out. Although other times I could be like, that's it. That's what you this, but no, thank you for that compliment. I I take it to heart for sure. So thank you again, Dominique, and everybody. Check out tomorrow. Come back at three p.m. tomorrow, where I'm going to be with Shaka Keen, the director of yeah. Judas and the Black Messiah. Stay well, stay safe, sister. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 I don't know.